Thank you very much uh, to all the three uh, speakers for their presentation. Um, I found them very interesting as a lawyer, and while all the three presenters were speaking, I was uh, really thinking of all the legal issues uh, involved in these so complex uh, technologies. And of course, this is uh, the aim of the project. If I can mention three problems, three issues that come in my mind, one is autonomy of these systems in relation especially to the, the, uh, the, their interactions with humans. Another one is the complexity of the system, both the complexity, let's say, in front of the user, how much the user can understand on the way the system is, uh, is working, and uh, how to explain how the system worked, how the system failed, for example, if I think uh, uh, of, uh, if I'm thinking about a, judges, a judge trying to assess in, uh, in, in a process, or a party trying to uh, 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 explain, to escape from uh, the, the proof, or to explain, to give the proof of the evidence, for example, on uh, all the, causal, the, the, the causality chains between all the, these uh, systems and uh, their complex interactions. And another thing is the, from my understanding, the, uh, the, 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 the increase of the quantity and quality of the information exchange within these, uh, these uh, systems. This seems to me uh, um, the, uh, the main legal issues in this moment. Of course, uh, as Nisklas said, <laughs> there is always this fear that uh, the, the lawyers try to hinder, to stop innovation. This is partially true, but it is also true that awareness of these uh, issues helped in many sectors to sometimes push for a change in the law. And that change in the law, in the regulation, was the key factor for the adoption of new technologies. I'm thinking, for example, in the automotive sectors and all the safety enabling technologies such as, for example, airbags. But we will talk of this in, uh, later pre in other presentations. I'm surprised of the list of uh, questions that Mark <laughs> presented in the last slide because surprisingly most of, the question, of those questions are our questions. So it seems that we are in the right track. Of course, we don't have at this moment the solution for all those questions, but some of them in particular about, for example, the failure of, of a what-if system. That is a very interesting question. There is not an easy answer, of course. I think it depends largely on the capabilities of each system in terms of autonomy, in capabilities not only of suggesting decision, but maybe in, future, in the future of taking the decision autonom autonomously, on the capability of the system of interacting with the environment, for example, and acquire information, uh, learn new things that the human operator doesn't, doesn't know. And uh, I think that, of course, all these things should, must change the way a law, the, 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 the way the, 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 the problem is treated and solved from a legal point of view. Otherwise, we, as a lawyer, would fail in capture the reason, the very reason why we are adopting these systems, because we, not, we cannot, of course, ask to the operator to, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, take the same border, the same cognitive burden in taking the decision and controlling the, uh, supervising the decision suggested, for example, by a system, as if the system is not adopted at all. Uh, this is my point of view. So I open uh, the discussion to uh, 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 your uh, 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 question and answers, first of all, between our uh, uh, speakers and also to all of you. Fabio Rutalenia, just a question, uh, Mark, but also to, to the other uh, guys. There is a, a good question on your uh, slides. Can be the system uh, liable? I would like to know your opinion, because up to now, the system is not liable. Are the person liable? The question is, for the future, we are uh, expecting that uh, this kind of arrangement can be changed or not. Thank you. 
Well, of course, I think that uh, the, uh, the shift of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, part of the task from the human operator to the system implies in some ways the shift also of liability, not only in quantity of liability, but also in quality of liability. You can observe, for example, that if, if you move the liability from a human operator, usually the framework in which you are moving when you are speaking about the liability of human of, of, of operator is uh, the framework of negligence. So you are talking about, uh, you are observing uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the fault, the, the, the negligence in the operator, while when you are moving the attention and part of the task to the liability uh, uh, of a system itself, maybe you are adopting a different perspective, for example, product liability and therefore strict liability, for example. So there is a change. I, 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 I would say that the system is would be partially liable, more and more liable in the future, with a change also in the quality of liability, in the way we, 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 we assess the liability and also in, 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 in the framework we are adopting. The more the system, I would say, is autonomous, saying that the system is autonomous, I mean a system which is capable of uh, have, having its own goals in taking its own decisions and also of interacting with the, with the environment. Of course, is a, it, there is not a, a, a one on-off, one-zero solution, but there are different degrees of autonomy and therefore of liabilities of the system. I'm not a lawyer, and I think we're entering uh, legal et ethnology uh, discussion or legal philosophical approach. There are, there's some research has been carried out on, on issues like this. Well, uh, my contribution would be more on uh, link to the presentation we saw this morning uh, by Professor Cantoni on, on, on how we treat the system. Do we treat it in a causal chain and we look for the actor, or do we treat it as a let's call it just, or like a systemic, socio-technological complex system where we approach it from a systemic point of view, from the legal analysis. In aviation, on, on uh, what we have seen as recent trends, Mont odile they found an 85-year chief designer and engineer of the system to be accused. Uh, in Gonesse, the Concorde one, uh, I'm all talking about Napoleonic court things, so I don't know about common law, but most there might be people in here who have similar example. Again, we go against a person who, on the maintenance side of somewhere on the other uh, side of the Atlantic to find an individual. We can actually try to to finally have an objective uh, endangering of all these things. So, the trend in aviation is 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 not necessarily going towards the system. It might be seen a little bit differently, but that is more, as I said, that's more philosophical approaches to it when you start to accuse organizations or managers or middle managers where you try to bring in this, this notion of there are more than one. That's also what, what we are all saying. We are, we are working in a risk industry who is working, which is working towards 10 to the minus 6. That means whenever something happens, it cannot be just one thing. And a human error in that case, we always say from a systemic uh, safety point of view, the human error is only a consequence of the system. It's never the cause which will lead to the accident. So that, that is also something which is well understood, well researched in, in systemic safety science. But of course, we need to bridge that gap without asking for a blame-free environment. This is very difficult. So, Pierre Bachelier from Airbus. Uh, I suggest to add the, uh, uh, an additional question to the list from Mark. So, what the crew should do when he will receive some uh, contradictory information from ground system and from airborne system? I will take an example, not the TCAS, which is well known, but from the ground system, as we saw in the last presentation, uh, on the airport, we will have the presentation of the different aircraft, uh, taxi, uh, taxi guidance, and so on. But we are in Cesar developing, I would say, a similar approach inside the cockpit, where we will have the, the crew will have an airport moving map, will receive the taxi clearance from the, from the airport, and you will receive directly from the aircraft their position. So we may imagine that in some cases, 
the guidance from the ground system, from the urban system, could be different. So what would be uh, what the crew should do? What, what would be the safety case? What would be the liability depending of the decision? We, what we always say is we try to follow the conflict management of IKEA, which is layered in three levels. So when you approach a new procedure or if you approach a new system which comes in or in interaction, interoperability interaction, that means on the first level the strategical issue. Whatever you can solve on strategical issue, you solve on the strategic level. So typically, STCA, TCAS, this, this traffic collision avoidance system, when does the human come into play, when is the machine, all these things should actually be uh, addressed at the, at the strategic level. ICAO, however, puts TCAS at the third, at the lowest level, layer of conflict management. And then you have the whole, so what, what you would then design is the airspace at the strategic level. You would design the technology at the strategic level towards certain um, safety levels. And then you would go down and the interaction which is currently working on the, on the human, that means training, certification, licensing, recensing, all these things which you put in there, plus the, the pilot side, the interaction and so on. And then you go in the last layer, in the lowest layer, which is then the conflict layer, the conflict avoidance layer, where you have short term conflict alert and things like this. Having said all this, I have no answer. But what we actually are looking sceptically, we are working in about 68 work packages of CESAR. And we are looking sometimes into, to, we contribute with, with some input. We, we are looking at, at some of the issues where we try, where, the, where technology tries to po um, build common points of failure. It can be, doesn't necessarily have to be on safety, it can also be on procedure or interoperability where we, we merge all these things on a central point and then we build the redundancy here. So that's mo some sort of a network uh, idea of, of, of a solution where most probably with the technology available today, we, w we should actually redistribute it. So typically in an airport environment, why having one radar head or two radar head and a redundancy radar head where you can put 400 small antennas which are cheaper and you put that everywhere and even if two or three of them do not work, you still have 388 or 398 others which will give you that and which can give you this different system. Having said all this, again, as soon as it becomes complexer, it will fade complexer. So the, the complexity increased the failure scenarios and, and we are not there also from a human factor science point of view where you have to say, well, I follow my, sh my machine, but if you're then in a situation where the machine puts you in scenarios where you have never been before and you don't know what to do anymore with it, you need to develop and train completely new uh, type of, of, of skills where you say, okay, I don't follow the, the book anymore, I follow rather what my intuition, but you have to train and educate this intuition. So it's a challenge. But I would say, can we make a list? I don't know. Can we follow the, the, the 10 principle of Airbus in automation of a cockpit? Can we follow the 10 principle in, in, of the European ATM to, to introduce automation? I have no answer to your question. Um, just, uh, I'd like to go back a little bit to the, um, the issue of transferring uh, liability to the system, which is definitely a huge issue. Uh, and also maybe to explain a little bit better what it is that the uh, ETSEP or the, the TAIFETSIA represents what is it that they do exactly. The, they are the guys that uh, uh, will be at the sharp end of this transition because the systems on the ground, the automation layer as we call it, the, the, this huge uh, influx of new technology which will uh, build uh, a very complex network uh, will have to be provided by industry, yes, but then it will be the human element that will check the systems, will certify the systems for operation, will put them in operation, will certify the software will oversee, monitor, control, namely monitor and control and certify the systems in remote towers. Does this mean that these guys are the, the guys to blame? 
Absolutely not. As Marx says, this this uh, inherent uh, butterfly effect here. It's not one single. It can be one single uh, issue somewhere, but uh, that starts a chain. But it is not that one single event that will uh, be to blame. And it, for this reason, uh, we also have to consider another technological mitigation factor here, which is to introduce and to work on uh, uh, what is um, referred to as systems health monitoring. We have to be pro proactive in terms of trying to predict failure systems, failure modes, failure situations. And this is a highly complex, uh, um, highly complex analysis and uh, can include in uh, procedures as well, not just the systems itself, themselves. Uh, uh, this in itself is a field that will simplify uh, vastly the approach towards liability when there is, we hope, very, uh, very few accidents, but when there is an accident, systems health monitoring is definitely a huge mitigation factor to introduce here and it should be considered. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, so I wanted to follow up a second on the issue whether the system is liable that was addressed before. So I would say no, a system is not liable, but the system can be responsible. Because when we say responsible, it means that uh, <coughs> an agent caused a certain damage or can be blamed for a certain damage. When we say that he's liable, it means that he has to pay the costs uh, uh, the legal counsel, obviously a system, we are not going to put a system in prison or uh, we are not going to destroy him because uh, he acted wrongly or to force him pay. So a system cannot be liable, I would say, but uh, it can be responsible in the sense that the system may have caused the damage and the system may have acted wrongly beyond the expected level of performance. So this is how I would uh, uh, frame the, 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 the issue that we, that we addressed before. And um, uh, what else did I want to say? Yes, uh, and then I wanted to also to put a question to, uh, to our speakers uh, concerning um, the issue of responsibility. We are focusing on um, responsibility of systems, uh, but um, is it true that all these technology are safety enhancing? So if they are really safety enhancing, uh, it means that the total amount of expected damage is diminished. So, Somebody may have additional responsibility, but somebody else may have less responsibility in the sense of less liabilities, in the sense of less costs to pay as a consequence of, uh, of errors. So um, is it true that all those technology enhances safety? And so our problem is just to distribute liabilities and there were problems even before automation was introduced or is automation making things worse as uh, uh, the effects are concerned? Because in this case, it's not just a problem of redistributing liabilities, but it's also the problem of covering these additional liability that are introduced maybe for the sake of efficiency. I'm the only one in front, so I'm, I try, but maybe somebody else can help me as well from the speakers. So, uh, whatever new system is been brought in the operational scene will have to be safe or will have to pass a certain standard of safety. But if we are, and I'm not cynical here, if we are honest to ourselves, it only serves to increase the capacity, that's it. So you need to become better. Where there are lacks of, let's say, I'm talking from a modern ATM equipment point of view. When there are lacks of, let's say, radar coverage or equipage level which are needed for to go somewhere, yes, of course, then they are safety contributing. But from a certain point of, of departure, it starts to be only capacity or business logic which come in. But the system which comes in has to be safe. So I cannot get a new system, a, a trajectory prediction or a clearance adherence monitoring tool which would then endanger the whole thing. Having said all this, we are also producing an increase in capacity with safety. So the byproduct is actually safety or if you turn it around, it 
we are producing safety, but actually that doesn't stand because you can't really measure safety. It's an absence of, in, uh, it's a non-event, uh, it's a dynamic non-event safety. So uh, it goes in line with, with um, mainly the, the measurable part, which is, which is performance, and that means capacity. I don't know if I have answered a little bit. I understand that uh, um, <coughs> these efficiency uh, reasons are important, uh, and I understand that you need to balance uh, safety with uh, performance at a certain at a certain stage. I just was wondering where you move from uh, when you automate a function that was previously performed by humans, separation or whatever. Uh, would you do it? Uh, is there always an increase in safety as well, or at least a non-decrease in safety, uh, or? Uh, uh, as compared, not as compared uh, with, with the optimum, but as compared with the previous uh, uh, um, uh, way in which the function was, function was exercised, that is uh, by uh, entrusting it to humans uh, with the possibility of human error. That was it. If you take, for example, the North Atlantic, if we can get a radar-like surveillance, or if we can reduce the separation to a level we haven't seen, then the, the safety will most probably automatically increase because you have a better prediction level and improved uh, execution level of all this. So why are we separating aircrafts so with so large distance? That's because we are building in the tolerance which either the system or the, the, the human in the system provokes. But basically from a physical point of view, we could just simply separate the aircraft by the distance it has to miss the other one physically speaking. If you can then give me a 